morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Press, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. I'll bet you're all just chomping at the bit to return to this book we're reading. I know I am. We're reading the book Romanism and the Reformation by Henry Grattan Guinness, one of the greatest Protestant writers, teachers, and preachers of all time. And I, this has got to be one of his premier books, Romanism and the Reformation from the Standpoint of Prophecy by Henry Grattan Guinness. We're currently in what I consider to be the most important chapter in this book. Probably the most important chapter of any book that I've ever read on First Amendment Radio, on Inquisition Update. This chapter is entitled Pre-Reformation Interpreters. We're talking about the interpreters of the Bible prophecies of Daniel, Paul, and John prior to the Protestant Reformation. Now, as preface, before we get into the text of the book, the Bible describes two churches, a faithful church and an unfaithful church. A true church, a church of Jesus Christ, and a false church, a church of Antichrist. One is the persecuted church, the other is the persecuting church. Now, I could go on for hours laying forth the contrasts and the comparisons between the church of Jesus Christ and the church of Antichrist, but by now you're getting a pretty good handle on that yourself. But let's go on to the subject that we're talking about in this chapter. These two churches, and as antagonistic as they are, we can expect that they would have antagonistic or diametrically different interpretations of the prophecies, and they do. One holds to the historicist interpretation of the prophecies, that the prophecies foretell the entire history of the church from its beginning to its end at the time when Christ returns. The other church, however, has much during that period that it would like to deny. Okay? The persecuting church, a lot of its history, it would love to deny... And it would love to deny that the prophecies of the Bible point to that church and indict that church and condemn that church and mark it as the church of Antichrist, the synagogue of Satan. So they conveniently say that the prophecies of the Bible simply deal with not the whole history of the church, but to one small segment of history just before Christ returns, and the object of which is to exonerate that persecuting church, to put the onus of Antichrist on someone in the distant future, not to be a concern to us, so that it may continue its diabolical, satanic, persecuting ways all throughout the Christian era, and constantly and continually shed the onus of Antichrist to a single individual way off in the future, and that it could falsely continue to put itself forward to the world as the true church of Jesus Christ. They are two antagonistic churches. They do indeed have two different antagonistic and contradictory interpretations of the scriptures and for a very good purpose we're going to see this now what was the pre-reformation era interpretation of the prophecies now i'm going to begin in the first full chapter on page 183 retreating just a little bit for continuity purposes page 183 in the book the first full paragraph h grattan guinness says 
We should not be surprised to find antagonistic schools of prophetic interpretation. But on the contrary, we should expect such. And we shall expect the apostates and persecutors to belong to the one school of Bible inter- prophecy interpretation and the faithful confessors and martyrs to another. If an officer of justice arrests a man because he perceives that he answers exactly to a description of a notorious criminal published by the government as a help to his identification, is it likely that the man himself will admit that the description fits him? He will, of course, deny the correspondence, but his denial will carry no weight. On turning to the history of prophetic interpretation, this is precisely what we find. With many varieties as to detail, we find there have existed and still exist two great opposite schools of interpretation, the papal and the Protestant, or the futurist and the historical. The latter, the historical, regards the prophecies of Daniel, Paul, and John as fully and faithfully setting forth the entire course of Christian history. The former, the futurist, the papal interpretation, shows forth chiefly with a, 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 is chiefly with a future fragment of time at its close. Okay? Skipping the, the whole history of the Christian church and focuses all of its attention at the very end of time. All right, the former or the futurist system of interpreting the prophecies, that is the Roman Catholic interpretation of the prophecies, as is now held, strange to say, by many Protestants. But it was first invented by the Jesuit Ribera at the end of the 16th century to relieve the papacy from the terrible stigma, and I will say the true stigma, cast upon it by the Protestant interpretation. The Protestant interpretation, I will will add in comment, the Protestant interpretation was the historical interpretation, and it identified the papacy as the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, that one which would deceive the whole world, and the, the historical interpretation was so so popular that it, it nearly destroyed the Roman Catholic Church. It nearly destroyed the papacy. People understood the historical interpretation of the prophecies and saw that they applied to the papacy and to the Roman Catholic Church, and they came out of the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church nearly was destroyed in protest simply because the people finally understood the prophecies. Now, the papacy would love to shed that terrible stigma that it is the church spoken of as the false church. The papacy would love to shed that terrible stigma that the papacy, the popes of Rome, are the Antichrist predicted in the Bible. So that's why they denounce the historical or the Protestant or the correct interpretation of Bible prophecy and hold to a futurist interpretation, which deals only with the very end of time. Okay, I'll continue now with the text. This interpretation was so evidently true. The historical interpretation of the prophecies were so evidently true and the intended one that the adherence of the papacy felt its edge. Speaking of the edge of a knife, the sharp cutting edge of a knife, at all costs must be turned or blunted. Okay, There must be a counter-reformation. There must be an alternative method of interpreting the prophecies that exonerates the papacy and, if possible, put the blame on the Protestants. Make the Protestant church look like 
the, the Antichrist church. All right, he continues. If the papacy were the predicted Antichrist, as Protestants asserted, there was an end of the question and separation from it, that is, from the Roman Catholic Church, became an imperative duty. Now, do you understand what put the Roman Catholic Church in dire jeopardy? People understood it. The question was answered. It's the Church of Rome. It is the papacy. That that which arose after the fall of the Roman Empire, the rebirth of the Roman Empire in the papal Roman Empire, and they separated from that church. And not only that, but they overthrew all the governments, all the monarchies of Europe that were established by the papacy. It was an indictment that could not be countered. Common sense dictated that everyone must abandon the Roman Catholic Church. Come out of her, my people, that you partake not of her sins and that you receive not also of her plagues. The Church of Antichrist, we must flee. And they did. Now, Guinness continues. Rome had to come up with an answer. He says, there were only two alternatives. If the Antichrist were not a present power, that is, if if the Antichrist was not the papacy, he must be either a past or a future one. Makes sense, right? Some writers asserted that the predictions pointed to Nero, in other words, in the past, one of the pagan Roman emperors, a very cruel man, right? He says, some writers asserted that the predictions or the prophecies about Antichrist pointed back to Nero. But this did not take into account the obvious fact that the anti-Christian power predicted in the Bible was to succeed the fall of the Caesars and even develop among the Gothic nations that overthrew it. Okay? Okay? So, the first hope that they can explain away the prophecies as having applied to Nero or one of the pagan Roman emperors falls flat on its face because the Bible clearly says that Antichrist won't come until after the Roman Empire has been broken into ten kingdoms. That, that puts the onus on the, on, on the Antichrist, on the papacy, because that's what arose after the old pagan Roman Empire and the Caesars, and after the establishment of the Ten Kings, the Ten Kingdoms. Okay, again, he says this did not take into account the obvious fact that the anti-Christian power predicted was to succeed or come after the fall of the Caesars and develop among the Gothic nations, those ten nations. Now, <clears throat> having rejected the 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 the, his, the 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 past interpretation, he says the other interpretive, uh, the other alternative, became therefore the popular one with papists. Antichrist was future, so Ribera and Bossuet and others taught. Okay. To exonerate the papacy, since they couldn't sell the idea that it was Nero, there was too many people who had read and understood the scriptures that that anti-Christian power wouldn't come until after the ten kingdoms came into being, which indicts the papacy. They had to just commit all their efforts to proving that Antichrist was in the future, the long-distant future, and this was the job of the Jesuit priest Ribera and Bossuet and others. Now, an individual man was intended to be the Antichrist, 
an individual man was intended, not a dynasty. The duration of his power would not be for twelve and a half centuries, but only three and one half years. He would be an open foe to Christ, not a false friend like the Pope. He would be a Jew and sit in the Jewish temple, not the Roman one. Speculation about the future took the place of the study of the past and the present, and careful comparison of the facts of history with the predictions of prophecy. So they took all the emphasis away from examining history and put all the emphasis on speculation about the long-distant future. How convenient for the Pope. That's what it accomplished. Don't look at the Pope. Don't look at the history of the Roman Catholic Church for the fulfillment of the prophecies. They're too damning to the papacy. You must shift your focus away off into the future for this man of sin, this son of perdition. Okay? This related, so it was asserted, not to the main course of the history of the church, but only to the few closing years of her history. The papal head of the Church of Rome was not the power delineated by the prophet Daniel and St. John. Accurately, as it answered to the description, it was not the criminal indicated. It must be allowed to go free, and the detective must look for another man who was sure to turn up by and by. The historic interpretation was, of course, rejected with intense and bitter scorn by the church it denounced as Babylon and the power it branded as Antichrist. And it is still opposed by all who in any way uphold these. It is held by many that the historic school of interpretation is presently only, is, is present, is, excuse me, is represented only by a small modern section of the church. Okay? Let me read it again. It is held by many that the historic school, that which incriminates the papacy in the Roman Catholic Church as the Antichrist and the synagogue of Satan, it is held by many that this historic school of interpretation is represented only by a small modern section of the church. In other words, a Protestant section of the church. We shall show that it has existed from the beginning and includes the larger part of the greatest and the best teachers of the church for 1800 years. Yes, Rome would like this, this to be this historical interpretation of, the, of, of Bible prophecy to be a minority, an inconsequential, discredited minority of believers. But what we find in history especially the early writers of the Christian church in the first centuries, we find that they were all historical in their interpretation of these prophecies. The majority, the vast majority of Bible-believing Christians over the last 2,000 years have been historicists. And futurism, as popular as it is today, almost the orthodox teaching in the churches, is the minority. It is ex it, That interpretation of the prophecies has only existed since the late 1800s. All Bible Christians before that time were historicists. They understood. This generation is the one that is deceived. 
Again, he says, it is held by many that the historic school of interpretation is represented only by a small modern section of the church. We shall show that it has existed from the beginning and includes the larger part of, and of the greatest and best teachers of the, of the church for 1,800 years. We shall show that the fathers of the church belong to it, that the most learned medieval, medieval commentators belong to it, that the confessors, reformers, and martyrs belong to it, and that it has included a vast multitude of erudite expositors of latter times. We shall show that all these have held to the central truth that prophecy faithfully mirrors the church's history as a whole and not merely a commencing or closing fragment of that history. It is held by many that the futurist school of interpretation is represented chiefly by certain Protestant commentators and teachers who deny that the prophecy of the man of sin relates to the Pope of Rome. What we shall show is that the futurist school of interpretation, on the contrary, is chiefly represented by teachers belonging to the Church of Rome, that the popes, the cardinals, the bishops, and the priests of that apostate church are all futurists, and that the futurist interpretation is one of the chief pillars of Romanism. Two interpretations of prophecy are before us, the historic and the futurist. The historical school of interpretation regards these prophecies as reflecting the history of the Fourth, or the Roman Empire, in all its most important aspects, from first to last, including especially the dark apostasy which has long prevailed in Christendom, the testimony and suffering of God's faithful people amid this apostasy, and the ultimate triumph of their cause. On the other hand, the futurist school of interpretation regards these prophecies as dealing almost exclusively with the distant future of the consummation, regards them as dealing chiefly not with what has been for the last 1,800 years, but with what will be in some final spasm at the close. The war against the saints waged by the Roman little horn as predicted by Daniel, the proud usurpations of the man of sin and his antagonism to the cause of true religion foretold by Paul, the blasphemous pretensions and persecution, persecuting deeds of the revived head of the Roman Empire set forth in the prophecies of John all of these are regarded by this futurist school as relating to a brief future period immediately preceding the second advent. And it is wrong, straight from the pit of hell, to protect Antichrist. We'll be back right after this. it first on firstamendmentradio.com and firstamendmentradio.net visit crosstheborder.org c r o s s crosstheborder.org to get your print epub or pdf version of the book the rapture will be canceled that's crosstheborder.org i know you all want answers and believe me so do i and i'll do my best to get them Despite Nicolas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the left behind movie 
with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce, in the minds of all, this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Cancelled. The author exposes the Latin rapture origin, the seven-year tribulation deception, true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America in the revelation, the image of the beast and the mark of the beast, and the truth about God's chosen people, and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter the left behind paradigm of future events. Get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's crosstheborder.org. Welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. This author is telling us in Romanism and the Reformation that there are two churches called Christian in the world. One is the true church. The other is the false church. They are antagonistic in every way. And they are particularly antagonistic in their interpretation of the prophecies of Daniel, Paul, and John. One, the true church, the Protestant church, the church of Jesus Christ, holds to the historical interpretation of Bible prophecy The false church, the church of Antichrist, the Roman Catholic church, holds to futurism. Rome would love to deny her history and say that these prophecies do not apply to her, but apply to someone way off in the future. But history proves otherwise. History proves that it can, the prophecies can apply to no one else but the Roman Catholic church and the papacy. The man of sin, the son of perdition, the one who persecutes the saints throughout all the Christian history, who is drunk with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, who has slain God's saints for nearly 2,000 years. The author continues, he says, The war against the saints waged by the Roman little horn of the prophecies of Daniel the proud usurpations of the man of sin and his antagonism to the cause of true religion, true Christianity foretold by Paul, the blasphemous pretensions and persecuting deeds of the revived head of the Roman Empire set forth in the prophecies of John, all of these are regarded by this futurist school of of, of prophecy interpretation the Roman Catholic interpretation of the, of the prophecies as relating only to a brief future period immediately preceding the second advent of Christ. The futurist school denies the application of these important practical prophecies to the conflicts of the church during the last 18 centuries. It robs the church of their practical guidance all through that period. This is the position taken by the Church of Rome. This is the position taken by the popes, the cardinals, the archbishops, the bishops, and other great teachers of that apostate church. This is the prophetic interpretation that they have embodied in a thousand forms and insisted upon with dogmatic authority. This has been the interpretation of proud papal usurpers, of cruel persecutors, 
of merciless, merciless tyrants, of the Romanist enemies of the gospel, and of the saints and the servants of God. We shall find, on the other hand, as we study the subject, that the historic interpretation of prophecy, the interpretation which condemns Rome, and which Rome consequently condemns, grew up gradually with the progress of events and the development of the apostasy of Latin Christianity, that it slowly modified its details under the illuminating influence of actual facts, but that it retained its principles unaltered from age to age, that it was defended by a multitude of earnest students and faithful expositors, and that it shaped the history of heroic struggles and of glorious revivals of spiritual life and testimony. This is the interpretation whose history during 15 centuries we propose to review this evening. We shall divide these 15 centuries into three periods. Number one, the period extending from apostolic times to the fall of the Roman Empire in the 5th century. Number two, the period extending from the fall of the Roman Empire and the rise of the papacy in the 5th century to its exaltation under the pontificate of Gregory the Seventh, called Hildebrand, the founder of the papal theocracy in the in the 11th century. Then number three, the period from Gregory the Seventh, Hildebrand, to the Reformation, to the Protestant Reformation. First then, let us glance at the history of prophetic interpretation in the internal, in the interval extending from the apostolic times to the fall of the Roman Empire in the fifth century, the first period we discussed. This was the period of the so-called fathers of the Christian church. A multitude of their writings remain to us, containing not only almost countless references to the prophecies in question, but complete commentaries on Daniel and the Apocalypse. It is boldly claimed by many that the fathers of the first five centuries held the futurist interpretation of these books, we deny the correctness of this position and assert that the fathers of the first five centuries belong to the historical school of interpretation. It was impossible for them, owing to the early position which they occupied, rightly to anticipate the manner and the scale of the fulfillment of these wondrous prophecies. But as far as their circumstances permitted, they correctly grasped their general significance and adhered to the, in, the interpretation which regards prophecy as a foretelling of the whole course of the church's warfare from the first century to the second advent of Christ. It is impossible at this time to do more than present a brief summary of the views of the fathers on this subject. And, and to name and refer you to their works. Number one. The fathers interpreted the four wild beasts of prophecy as representing the four empires. Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. Let me just add, this is indisputed today. This is undisputed. Now, here we have the foundation of the historical interpretation of prophecy. Take, as an instance, the words of Hippolytus on the great image of the four wild beasts of Daniel. Quote, The golden head of the image, unquote, he says, quote, is identical with the lioness by which the Babylonians were represented. The shoulders and the arms of silver are the same with the bear by which the, the, the Persians and the Medes are meant. The belly and the thighs of brass are the leopard, by which the Greeks, who, were, who ruled from Alexander onward, 
are intended. The legs of iron are the dreadful and terrible beast by which the Romans, who hold the empire now, are meant. The toes of clay and iron are the ten horns which are to be. The one other little horn springing up in their midst is the Antichrist. The stone that smites the image of the beast in pieces and that filled the whole earth is Christ, who comes from heaven and brings judgment on the world. Unquote. This statement is remarkable for its clearness, its correctness and condensation, and expresses the view held still by the historic school. Hippolytus says in his treatise on Christ and Antichrist, quote, Rejoice, blessed Daniel, thou hast not been in error. All these things have come to pass, unquote, page 19 of the work. Quote, already the iron rules, already it subdues and breaks all in pieces, already it brings all the unwilling into subjection, already we see these things ourselves. Now we glorify God being instructed by thee, unquote, page 20. See any futurism in that? No, it's all historicism. Number two, the fathers held that the ten-horned beast of Daniel and John are the same. As an instance, Irenaeus, in his book, Against Heresies, chapter 26, says, quote, John, in the Apocalypse, teaches us what the ten horns shall be, which were seen by Daniel, unquote. Number three, the fathers held the historic interpretation of the apocalypse. As Eliot says, none of the fathers, quote, entertained the idea of the apocalyptic prophecy overleaping the chronological interval were it less or greater antecedent to the consummation and plunging at once into the times of the consummation, unquote. In other words, this man, Eliot, says, quotes the fathers as holding to an historical interpretation of the scriptures, that it doesn't overleap, that the prophecies do not overleap the entire history of the Christian church and just focus on one brief period of time at the consummation before Christ's return. Eliot says the fathers, those whose writings are still extant and can be, can be read for yourself, those who are upheld as authorities in the Christian church today, the early writers and expositors of the Christian church, those most closely related to the apostolic times, they were not futurists. They were historicists. Now he says, here, for example, is the commentary of Victorinus on the Apocalypse of John, written towards the end of the third century. This is the earliest commentary extant on the Apocalypse as a whole. In this, the going forth of the white horse under the first seal is interpreted of the victories of the gospel in the first century. This view, you will observe, involves the historical interpretation of the entire book of Revelation. Victorinus interprets the woman clothed with the sun, having the moon at her feet, and wearing a crown of twelve stars on her head, and travailing in her pains as, quote, the ancient church of fathers, prophets, saints, and apostles, unquote. In other words, the Judeo-Christian body of saints. He could not, of course, point it. He could not, of course, point to fulfillments which were at his early date still future, but he recognizes the principle. Number four, the fathers held that the little horn of Daniel, the man of sin foretold by Paul, 
and the revived head of the Roman Empire predicted by John represent one and the same power. And they held that that power was to be the Antichrist. They all spoke of the papacy, the Antichrist of Scripture. He continues, he says, for example, Origen, in his famous work, Against Celsus, thus expresses himself in Book 6, Chapter 46. After quoting nearly the whole of Paul's prophecy about the man of sin in Second Thessalonians, which he interprets of the Antichrist, he says, quote, Since Celsus rejects the statements concerning Antichrist, and as it is termed, having neither read what is said of him in the book of Daniel, or in the writings of Paul, nor what the Savior in the gospel has predicted about his coming, we must make a few remarks on this subject. Paul speaks of him who is called Antichrist, describing, though with a certain reserve, both the manner and time and cause of his coming. The prophecy also regarding Antichrist is stated in the book of Daniel and is fitted to make an intelligent and candid reader admire the words as truly divine and prophetic. For in them are mentioned the things relating to the coming kingdom, beginning with the times of Daniel, and I will add the words, in Babylon, and continuing to the destruction of the world, unquote. In other words, the entire Christian history, not just a brief period of time at the end, just before Christ returns. Now he continues, he says, Jerome, in his commentary on the book of Daniel, chapter 7, says, with reference to the little horn which has a mouth speaking great things, that, quote, it is the man of sin, the son of perdition, who dares to sit in the temple of God, making himself as God, unquote. Number five, the fathers held that the Roman Empire was the let, or the hindrance, referred to by Paul in Second Thessalonians, which kept back the manifestation of the man of sin. The Roman Empire, the Caesars, were the ones who were restraining the rise of Antichrist. Paul knew all this, and he taught it to the Thessalonians, plainly telling them that the power that now exists will continue to hinder the rise of Antichrist until he is taken out of the way. And when he's taken out of the way, look out. The man of sin will be revealed. The son of perdition, the little horn of Daniel, the Antichrist will be revealed to the whole Christian world. Folks, that was 2,000 years ago, or nearly so, 1,800 years ago. The Antichrist is not going to be revealed in the future. The prophecies don't permit it. And we must not believe it. And if we do believe it, we must repent. The fathers held that the Roman Empire, the old pagan Roman Empire, was the let or the hindrance referred to by Paul in Second Thessalonians, which kept back the manifestation of the man of sin. This point is of great importance. Paul distinctly tells us that he knew and that the Thessalonians knew what that hindrance was, what that let was, and that it was then in existence. In their day, it was in existence. The early church, through the writings of the fathers, tell us what it knew about this subject and with remarkable unanimity affirms that this let, or this hindrance, preventing the rise of Antichrist, I will add, was the Roman Empire as governed by the Caesars. That while the Caesars held imperial power, it was impossible for the predicted Antichrist to arise. And that on the fall of the Caesars, he would arise. Here we have a point upon which Paul affirms the existence of knowledge in the Christian church. The early church knew, he says, 
what this hindrance was, the early church tells us what it did know upon this subject, and no one in these days can be in a position to contradict its testimony as to what Paul had by word of mouth only told the Thessalonians. It is a point on which ancient tradition alone can have no, can have any authority. Modern speculation is positively impertinent on such a subject. Now here the author gives us a lengthy note, a very important note, and we'll read it. As to the let or the hindrance to the manifestation of the man of sin referred to in 2 Thessalonians 2, Mr. Elliot says, quote, We have the consenting testimony of the early fathers from Irenaeus, the disciple of the disciple of St. John, down to Chrysostom and Jerome, to the effect that it was understood to be the imperial power ruling and residing at Rome, unquote. And this is from the very, very important work, a work that we'll eventually get to here on Inquisition Update, entitled Jorge, Ap- Jorge Apocalyptica, Volume 3, page 92. Continuing with the note, it says, Irenaeus held that the division of the Roman Empire into ten kingdoms would immediately precede the manifestation of Antichrist. In his work, Against Heresies, Book 5, Chapter 30, he says, quote, Let them await in the first place the division of the kingdom into ten. Then in the next place, when these kings are reigning and beginning to set their affairs in order and advance their kingdoms, let them learn to acknowledge that he who shall come claiming the kingdom for himself and shall terrify those sons of men of whom we have been speaking, having a name containing the aforesaid number 666, is truly the abomination of desolation. Thus, according to Irenaeus, the manifestation of Antichrist required the previous overthrow of the then existing Roman Empire. Tertullian's apology thus describes the habit of the Christian church of the second century to pray for the security of the Roman Empire in the knowledge that its downfall would bring the catastrophe of the reign of Antichrist and the ruin of the world. Addressing the, quote, rulers of the Roman Empire, unquote, he says, quote, We offer prayer for the safety of our princes to the eternal, the true, the living God, whose favor beyond all others they must themselves desire. Thither we lift up our eyes with hands outstretched because free of sin, with head uncovered, for we have nothing whereof to be ashamed. Finally, without a monitor, because it is from the heart we supplicate. And without ceasing, for all our emperors, we offer prayer. We pray for long life, we pray for life prolonged, for security to the empire. With our hands thus stretched out and up to God, Rend us with your iron claws. Hang us up on crosses. Wrap us in flames. Take our heads from us with the sword. Let loose the wild beasts upon us. The very attitude of a Christian praying is the preparation for all punishment. Let this, good rulers, be your work. Wring from us the soul, beseeching God on the emperor's behalf upon the truth of God and devotion to His name, put the brand of crime. And there's also another and greater necessity for our offering prayer in behalf of the emperors, nay, for the complete stability of the empire and for Roman interests in general. For we know 
that a mighty shock impending over the whole world. In fact, the very end of all things threatening dreadful woes is only retarded by the continued existence of the Roman Empire. We have no desire then to overtake these dire events and in praying that the coming may be delayed, we lend our aid to Rome's duration. That was the attitude of the first century Christians, to pray for the continuation of the pagan Roman Empire, because what would replace it would be worse. The papal Roman Empire. If you put your arms around me, could it change the way Hi, Nicholas here. I used to lug those big jugs to the market to fill with water from those coin-operated filter machines. 25 cents a gallon or 5 gallons for a buck. I used to. Then I got the big Berkey. Now I save my back. Gold and silver is tremendously undervalued. Global demand vastly exceeds mine supply by more than 60% annually. There is little in the financial world more certain than a coming explosion in the prices of gold and silver. The U.S. dollar continues to lose value and respect as the world's reserve currency. Our nation faces challenges on many fronts, and a day doesn't pass without another economist bringing forth warnings of impending economic calamity. There has never been a better time than right now to acquire physical gold and silver. Discount Gold and Silver Trading was founded on the principles of truth and honesty. 
We believe in providing a quality product, quality service, and most importantly, competitive pricing. We provide all forms of precious metals, including American gold, silver, platinum, and rare investment and circulated coins. Silver bars, rounds, and 90% silver bags are on hand for the silver investor. Gold self-directed IRAs are available. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, that's 1-800-375-4188. Years ahead of the dominant media, FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening.